Well, today we've got a diss track on our hands, so you know what that means. Time for a convoluted clusterfuck of egos that does nothing but talk past each other and have shouting matches in the form of music over shit that, when you look into it, is usually some insignificant shit that could have been solved with a short conversation. But before we get started, this was a request by D. Boo, and if you'd like to make a song, movie, or live stream request, click on over to my Kofi link, as well as my Patreon, where if you're a patron, you get a special deal of half off of all requests for Kofi. So get with it, act like you want it, and let's get into the review. Okay, so let's talk about the Nicki Minaj Lil' Kim beef that inspired today's song. Now, this beef has always felt like a pretty unfair matchup from the get-go. Uh, between a weathered, fresh-out-of-jail veteran MC who hasn't had a hit in half a decade up against a burgeoning superstar hot on the heels of a string of incredible guest verses and the hype machine payoff of a debut album right around the corner, it, it was obvious who was going to be perceived as the winner to the masses. But when it comes to lyric for lyric, bar for bar, does Nicki's stupid hoe actually bury Lil' Kim? Well, yes, because quite honestly, the Lil' Kim Black Friday joint was really fucking weak. You need to stop, you're not hot, you're a burning match. That means the end is near soon. Copy that, ho. Oh, I see they really got you gas. Like, I'm a thing of the past. When you put Kim's diss against Stupid Ho, it pretty plainly comes off like the rush job of someone with a bruised ego who saw someone imitating their look and got sour grapes over it. That said, I wouldn't exactly call it a lyrical landslide either. As much as Kim's Black Friday record was a dud, Nicki's song just barely ekes out enough specific jabs to be considered more than a subliminal. See, for a solid diss track, the anger has to be persuasive. So the one who feels the most like the winner is the one who makes the strongest case for their narrative. Because when you feel like you're justified in dissing your target, people are quicker to jump on your side. For a perfect example, let's look at a different matchup. Anyone remember the beef between Eminem and Insane Clown Posse? At the time, when I'd first gotten into Eminem and heard all those references to ICP, I remember not being sure what was happening and just chalked it up to some local Detroit beef he had with some weird local indie rap group about who's the craziest white boy rapper from the Motor City that just got out of hand or something. But when I decided to check out ICP's response out of curiosity, they actually laid out their point of contention pretty clearly. I remember your ass, St. Andrews Hall, handing out your flyers. They addressed the fact that Eminem had kicked off the bad blood first by lying early in his career, claiming that he had booked ICP for a show only to ask them to do the gig once they confronted him about it. What the fuck kind of rapper could be that name? Only way you draw people is a use on names. I could have just fucked you up right there, but I let it pass. I felt bad for your bitch ass. And see, Em never addressed that part of the beef in any of his songs. All Eminem virtually ever said about them in his disses were just a bunch of toothless homophobic slurs. So it always felt like someone blindly lashing out at an enemy they didn't want to admit might have a point. You see, usually the person who's in the right will give you a pretty vivid detailing of why. But the person who's in the wrong will defend their egos by throwing up smoke screens and diversions to get you off of the reason why the diss is happening in the first place. Because when someone can't fill out their diss song with the actual reason why they needed to make a diss track in the first place, it comes off like it didn't really have a reason and we're either the person who was actually in the wrong and you don't want to admit it, or just a clout shark looking to get some shine off of their name. Now, of course, the dynamic can also be that one person is clout sharking for relevance and the other person is in the wrong but doesn't want to admit it, which, not gonna lie, really feels like the all about Eve type situation that was happening here. Because while the beef does start off feeling a little innocuous and petty with surface stuff like Nikki looking like she was emulating Kim's wigs and poses, when I think about stuff like that, well, you know, I, I can see you being annoyed if you're the originator, but let's be honest here, Kim was past her commercial relevance at this point. It's not like this is a designer situation where he's putting out tracks while Future was still on the airwaves. That said, when I come across Lil' Kim claiming to have signed to Young Money in order to be a promoter and songwriter for Nikki, only for Baby Slash Birdman to have apparently dropped communications with her and months later hearing samples of her flow on mixtape tracks, Kim's anger starts to feel a little justified. But even if we are to take our word on that interview, well, one of the key details is that Kim talks about one of the songs she ripped off from her being called Automatic, a pure EDM pop song produced by Red One on Nicki's album. However, as far as I can find, she hasn't released her original version, so until she's confronted about that, it's just a declaration without hard proof. But see, this is the unsatisfying experience of what looking into a beef is. A bunch of claims by one person that another person either didn't hear or doesn't really have any obligation to respond to the veracity of the evidence of, because, you know, no one's ever going to corner both of them in a room and get them to agree on any key details on which truth was what, so many things end up just being open-ended questions. And music-wise, unfortunately, Lil' Kim never really brought up the specifics of that in her track, so she lost those narrative points that she could have had, and instead her response comes off as harmless jabs from the hurt feelings of someone who just couldn't stomach the fact that someone in a new generation of artists who was influenced by her is doing well. So it pretty much left her wide open for Nicki to come back later that year with a track that would demolish anything she did by virtue of it not only being the next big hit by Nicki Minaj, but also by not having to respond to anything other than someone who just sounds bitter. The problem though is that I can barely give her props on this track either at the end of the day, because it's only marginally better than Kim's initial diss, and, and is tainted by virtue of just how absolutely salty she came off when she put this out. 
Because, like, let's not forget, Nikki released this well after the heat had died down from the initial disc. So it felt like she was just twisting the knife into someone who was already down for the count. So for all the cheap shots we end up getting on this track, it just feels like a super petty grievance she just couldn't let go. Now, I have to say, the first couple of lines do pack some punch as a hard opener. I'm Angelina, you Jennifer. Come on, bitch, you see where Brad at? With the celebrity relationship punchline being used to twist the narrative she's trying to spin. Oh, this isn't about me ripping you off, no, no, no. This is about you being jealous of me being the new it girl. I'm the hot young thing the game wants, and you're actually within 10 years of me, but you know, sexism in the industry, so any chick over 35 might as well apply for AARP memberships. Then you have lines like this, which honestly take up most of the song and are just kind of heard saying nothing in particular. Like, that's fucking nothing, man. Yeah, I know it's supposed to sound, but you know, raucous and confrontational, but I, I just have to say, this beat does not sound good. just so disjointed and awkward it feels like the first draft of someone failing at mixing an old looney tune sound effect into a beat it just doesn't fucking come together and this is honestly this is just a low blow like oh wow saying a black person looks like a monkey gee what a clever angle to attack her from and here's the thing though i, I actually do give her points for the later reference that she makes about kim's appearance hey yo baby bop fuck you and your because if you look at them side by side and you want to be an asshole about it, that actually does kind of look like what the years of plastic surgery has led Lil' Kim's face to kind of resemble. Plus, she follows it up by joking on her diss track EP that of course didn't make nearly as much money as Nicki's LP ended up making. Like, sure it's low, but it feels targeted and specific, and not just a line about looking like a monkey like this is some 1940s chitlin circuit comedy routine. And now back to the bullshit filler lyrics that don't really matter. Like, what the fuck is my reaction to these lines supposed to be if I'm supposed to take this as a diss track? Oh, one, two, three to the Nicki Minaj blink. How's Lil' Kim gonna recover from that one? You're stupid, You're stupid, You're stupid. What, what, what are you doing right now? Honestly, the only thing that Simi saves the track is the ending where she finally brings it back to who she's talking about. Stupid hoes is so wack. Stupid hoes should have befriended me. Then she could have probably came back. Which comes out like a pretty valid point. If they could have had a conversation in good faith and tried to resolve the differences they had, maybe this whole situation could have been to Lil' Kim's benefit. But unfortunately, that's not how things shook out. So instead, Nicki Minaj has to give her these lyrical hands to let Kim know that Nicki is a true MC in a league of her own. I am the female Wheezy. Uh, but then she undercuts that energy by saying, Well, actually, I'm more like the pink bowed gender flip of a more popular male artist. And it's like, what, what the hell, man? Like, to be clear, this song was the last track on the album that this is from. Uh, imagine if Eve from Rough Riders ended her album like, Hey guys, if you think about it, I'm like DMX, but for bitches, it'd be a little on the nose, wouldn't you say? Although when I first heard this line in 2011, it did leave me waiting for Drake to end his album like, and I am the light-skinned Wheezy. Collect all three so you can form the Mega Wheezy. Overall, I give this a two out of five. There are maybe three lowball punchlines in there that kind of work, but the lion's share of the track is a bunch of weird lyrical non sequiturs that vacillate between her being a bouncing off the walls bonkers cartoon and a hyper cool bad bitch who's totally chill and not the bug nuts crazy person she just portrayed herself as. Well, that's the episode. Leave a like if you like because it helps, comment if you have something to say because it helps even more, and hit the subscribe button because that's what helps the most. And if you want to support the show, of course, that's ko-fi.com slash rabbitcritic for one-time donations and patreon.com slash rabbitcritic for ongoing donations where you can see episodes early and join the RC Discord to chat with me and fellow fans. And until next time, I'm the Rab Critic. You don't have to like my opinions, but I don't have to like your song. Peace.